The complete timeline of the last days. Number one, the beginning of the last days. The Bible is a history book, but it is unlike any other history book available in any public library. The history of the Bible starts with the creation of the earth and ends with the end of the world. No other history book has ever been published that covers such a broad range of events on planet Earth. Partially, because no one was present at the start to witness and document it. And therefore, no one can write the beginning of our world authoritatively. We are the only folks in the whole world who know how it will all end. That is unique. The Lord did not reveal the future to his followers to satisfy their curiosity. It was to prepare them for the future so that they would not be surprised when it arrived and that they would not misinterpret it. Be grateful that Jesus was so forthright in sharing what the future holds for us. People ask, are we in the end times? However, the Bible talks of the last days and we have been in the last days for 2000 years. The last days started at Pentecost where the first prophecy of the last days was fulfilled. People also ask for the seven prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. Watch this video to the end to find out. Every Christian generation should live to be ready for the Lord's return. The Bible is a book full of predictions. Its pages contain 735 predictions about the future, a prediction that can be found in one quarter of the Bible's chapters. From beginning to end, it is basically a prophetic text, though some books focus more on predictions than others. 596 of the 735 predictions have indeed occurred and have literally come true according to the scripture prediction. So, 81% of all Bible prophecies have already come true, and some of those prophecies were made centuries before the case. It doesn't take much confidence to believe that the remaining 19% will happen as well. That's a very high score. Signs of the Return of Jesus Jesus told us to watch and pray. What do we watch? We cannot stand still and watch the clouds to wait for him to appear. That is not what he meant. He meant, keep an eye on what's going on in the world and see what signs I gave you to help you prepare. Signals are the signs. So, let's look at Matthew chapter 24, where the disciples asked him, what will be the signs or signals of your return? What would we do if we don't know when it's going to happen? To their inquiry, Jesus gave a direct and unambiguous answer. We can thank God that he responded in such a straightforward manner. In the book of Revelation, he gives us a much more detailed and comprehensive response. But here, he gives a rundown of the signs that will precede his arrival. The disciples approached Jesus secretly as he was seated on the Mount of Olives. Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 36. While he was seated on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will this take place, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end, the completion, the consummation of the age? Jesus answered them, Be careful that no one misleads you, deceiving you and leading you into error. But many will come in on the strength of my name, appropriating the name which belongs to me, saying, I am the Christ, the Messiah and they will lead many astray. And you will hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened or troubled, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in place after place. All this is but the beginning, the early pains of the birth pangs, of the intolerable anguish. Then they will hand you over to suffer affliction and tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and repelled and will begin to distrust and desert him, whom they ought to trust and obey, and will stumble and fall away and betray one another and pursue one another with hatred. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive and lead many into error. And the love of the great body of people will grow cold because of the multiplied lawlessness and iniquity. 
but he who endures to the end will be saved. And this good news of the kingdom, the gospel, will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then will come the end. So, when you see the appalling sacrilege, the abomination that astonishes and makes desolate, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader take notice and ponder and consider and heed this. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not come down and go into the house to take anything. And let him who is in the field not turn back to get his overcoat. And alas, for the women who are pregnant and for those who have nursing babies in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, affliction, distress, and oppression, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be again. And if those days had not been shortened, no human being would endure and survive. But for the sake of the elect, God's chosen ones, those days will be shortened. If anyone says to you then, behold, here is the Christ, the Messiah, or there he is. Do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise, and they will show great signs and wonders so as to deceive and lead astray, if possible, even the elect, God's chosen ones. See, I have warned you beforehand. So, if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, desert, do not go out there. If they tell you, Behold, he is in the secret places or inner rooms, do not believe it. For just as the lightning flashes from the east and shines and is seen as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever there is a fallen body, a corpse, there the vultures or eagles will flock together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and beat their breasts and lament in anguish, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and brilliancy and splendor. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect, his chosen ones, from the four winds, even from one end of the universe to the other. From the fig tree, learn this lesson, as soon as its young shoots become soft and tender and it puts out its leaves, you know of a surety that summer is near. So alas, when you see these signs, all taken together, coming to pass, you may know of a surety that he is near at the very doors. Truly I tell you, this generation, the whole multitude of people living at the same time in a definite given period, Will not pass away till all these things taken together take place. Sky and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that exact day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, in that passage, he gave four distinct signs of his coming. One of the four signs is already there, while the other three are not. That is why I say, we are in the beginning of the end times. So, what exactly are these four signs he gave us? The first is clearly disasters in the world. And he mentions, for example, wars, famines, and earthquakes. These are certainly happening, but they have been happening for over 2,000 years. They are getting more intense. So, we certainly are in this first sign. There are already wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, and famine. Jesus says, don't be deceived. He says that again and again, all the way through. As we get nearer to the end, the danger is deception, both inside and outside the church. In this case, he says from false Christs, false messiahs, people who will take advantage of the turmoil of natural disasters to present themselves as saviors. There are well-known examples of people who pretended to be saviors and led people into desert locations, only to end in tragedy. However, there are many false Christs, false saviors who claim to be the promised deliverer from all our troubles. The more problems there are, the more false deliverers there would be. But 
As Jesus advises us, don't be alarmed. Don't be worried when you learn of a new war, a new tragedy, or a new famine breaking out. He said something astonishing. These are painful events, but they are not pangs of death. They are birth pains. So when you read of disasters in the media, these are the pains that mean something new is about to be born. This should completely change our attitude. We know what the world is coming to. We should not be alarmed or dismayed, not as worried as the world will be about these things. Disasters in the world are the pain of birth in a new world that is to be born. Therefore, we are very different. We have sympathy for those who are suffering disasters, and hopefully we express it in help. But in our hearts, we are not alarmed. We are hopeful. We are looking for a new birth of a new world, and therefore we are not dismayed or depressed by all the problems in the world. In short, Jesus' advice to us would be not to panic, not to be disturbed, but even to rejoice and say, these are all signs of something new happening. The second sign. The second sign of his coming is not in the world, but in the church. Disasters in the world are the first sign. The church, not the world, is the second sign of his coming. The first warning is disasters around the world. The second is changes in the church. Just as he divided the first sign into three parts, wars, earthquakes, and famines, he divides the second sign into three parts, all of which occur within the church. The first is persecution, that we will be hated in every nation. The second aspect of this sign would be a significant reduction in the church's size. Most people's love will grow cold. When the whole church is under strain, many nominal Christians, if not all true Christians, would leave. Under the burdens of universal persecution, their love would grow cold. That's a very depressing sign. The big surprise in the third part of the sign is that the gospel will be preached to every racial group. The third part of the sign is that the gospel will be proclaimed. A smaller, purified church would have a greater impact on the planet. That is exactly what Jesus is implying. False prophets can be a source of deceit in all of this. We are aware of the teachings of false prophets. When there is no peace, they teach peace. Rather than being a source of challenge, their message is one of comfort. It's all right. It won't happen, they'll say. All is fine. Everything is fantastic. The church is in good hands. That is a false prediction. They may be to blame for the large number of people who would leave the church at that time. Now, Jesus' advice is to keep going. Don't give in to these false prophets. Whoever perseveres to the end will be saved. When that sign occurs, when all aspects of the church are despised by the world, that is Jesus' advice to all Christians. Why should that be the case? The answer is that wheat and tares grow together, and the closer they get to full maturity, the more tension there will be between them. So, it's only natural that Christians will be under a lot of pressure in the end. Christians are social misfits, so there would be hatred. This world does not belong to us. Our citizenship is in the heavenly realms. We are unique, and it is because of our uniqueness that hate can arise. Since Jesus was so different from everyone else, he drew hate against himself. John chapter 15, verse 19. If you were of the world, it would love you as its own. Instead, the world hates you because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. It's not fun to be despised. Third sign. That takes us to the third sign of the end times, which is Jerusalem's distress. Geographically, it will be very limited. In this passage, Jesus quotes Daniel's prophecies, and there is a character in Daniel's prophecies who is referred to as the abomination of desolation. Daniel mentions it three times. What does it all mean? What's the big deal? It's about a human being, a man, who establishes himself in the very city of God, calls himself God, and refuses to accept anyone else's will above his own. A tyrant whose arrival will have global ramifications, but who will be centered in Jerusalem, the city of God, the holy place. Then, Jesus says that the fourth sign of his coming will come immediately after that. 
So we shall know when he is coming. We shall be ready. When that sign comes, there will be no danger of false prophets or false messiahs. There will be no deception. It will be too quick. What will happen is that all natural light will be switched off. The sun will go dark. The stars will fall. There are many predictions of this all the way through the Bible. Isaiah predicts it. The heavens will be rolled up like a carpet. All the stars of heaven will be dissolved. The skies will be rolled up like a scroll, and all their stars will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like foliage from the fig tree. The natural light will be gone, leaving only artificial light to illuminate the earth. What is happening? What is going on, people may ask. This is it, Christians will exclaim. The sun, stars, and moon stop shining right before that happens. God turns off the lights of heaven to prepare for the blaze of light from the lightning that will mark his return. Then he comes on the clouds back to planet Earth, and we meet him. We are not meeting in an earthly stadium because there isn't one large enough to accommodate such a large crowd. We'll reach him in the air, and that'll suffice. Isn't that a fantastic prospect? When you see all these things, you know he is at the gates, just about to walk through he says. Number two, the rapture of the church. Christ comes in the clouds to snatch away all those who trust in him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. At this same time, the dead in Christ will be resurrected and taken to heaven too. When the Lord comes back and descends from heaven, his appearance will be visible to the whole world, as will the rise of his people to meet him in the air an event known as the rapture. Some have taught that there would be a secret rapture. Secret is the last word that should be used to describe the rapture. Nothing more public will ever take place in human history, as we see by Jesus' description. And shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Matthew chapter 24, verse 31. That is not a secret. Note also that this is not about being caught up in the church. Rather, it refers to those who remain on earth, who are the chosen ones of God. 1 Thessalonians 4 gives a comprehensive description of what will happen at that point. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, but ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now also we would not have you ignorant, brethren, about those who fall asleep in death, that you may not grieve for them, as the rest do who have no hope beyond the grave. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will also bring with him through Jesus those who have fallen asleep in death. For this we declare to you by the Lord's own word, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall in no way proceed into his presence or have any advantage at all over those who have previously fallen asleep in him in death. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud cry of summons, with the shout of an archangel, and with the blast of the trumpet of God. And those who have departed this life in Christ will rise first. Then we, the living ones who remain, on the earth shall simultaneously be caught up along with the resurrected dead in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so always, through the eternity of the eternities, we shall be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. There are two Greek words for air. One is ater, which gives us the ether. The other is aer, which gives us the air. Aer, the word for the lower air, which is contiguous with the surface of the earth, is the word used here. In other words, Jesus will be pretty close to earth when we are caught up in meeting him. How could anybody be unaware that something is going on when the Lord is shouting, the archangel is speaking, and God's trumpet is sounding? Some people say that the word rapture is not contained in the New Testament. This is quite true, but it depends on the translation applied. The New Testament, of course, was not originally written in English. We could easily translate that we will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17 as follows. We shall be raptured 
to meet the Lord in the air. It would be a perfectly legitimate translation. What about this word rapture? It is a fascinating gripping word. The Greek word is harpazo. Several different passages in the New Testament use this word to give us a clear picture of what the rapture will be like. First of all, three times in John 10, the word is used describing a wolf snatching a sheep from the fold. It is violent and abrupt. But the hired servant, who merely serves for wages, who is neither the shepherd nor the owner of the sheep, when he sees the wolf coming, deserts the flock and runs away. And the wolf chases and snatches them and scatters the flock. John chapter 10, verse 12. Four times in other passages, the same word is used of taking somebody by force from a crowd or from some situation. So here is a list of the features that the rapture implies. It will happen without warning. It will be sudden and forceful. There will be no time to be getting ready. If we are in the process of getting ready, we will be too late. Matthew chapter 24, with another then, tells how quickly the rapture will occur. Then, at this time, two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Matthew chapter 24, verses 40 through 41. The Gospel of Luke says there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. Luke chapter 17, verse 34. I tell you, in that night, there will be two people in one bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. So, there is a sudden dramatic, eternal separation of people closest to each other. Two women working in the mill, two men working in the field. When the rapture comes, it snatches one and leaves the other. Which will we be, snatched or left? It is important that we decide that issue. Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 through 44. Watch therefore, give strict attention, be cautious and active. For you do not know in what kind of a day, whether a near or remote one, your Lord is coming. But understand this, had the householder known in what part of the night, whether in a night or a morning, watch the thief was coming. He would have watched and would not have allowed his house to be undermined and broken into. You also must be ready, therefore, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. If the master had known what was going to happen, he would have stayed awake. He would have been watchful. So Jesus says, be ready. If we think we know, we really do not know. If we expect him to come at a certain time, that will not be the time he is coming. I emphasize this because millions of Christians have fallen for revelations that Jesus came on a certain day or at a certain time. It is totally contrary to his teaching. We noted earlier these words from Mark chapter 13. We have to be watching. That does not mean we have to stay wide awake without sleep. It means we must be sensitive. We look up at the trees and see and know for ourselves. We must stay awake. We must be alert. We must not be lulled into a carnal slumber. Many signs will occur in the heavens as the final days approach. Dramatic, astonishing signs. By this we know that His coming is near. There will be Jesus' glory, the Father's glory and the glory of the angels. Isaiah chapter 24 verse 23 says that the sun and moon will be embarrassed because their light will be so dim and ineffective by comparison. This appeals to me. I can just imagine it. And furthermore, that light, though so brilliant, will not hurt our eyes. I am looking forward to that. It is something worth waiting for, worth enduring for. If we lose sight of it, we are going to get despondent because things are going to get worse. Remember, the birth pangs are not going to diminish. They are going to increase. When the Lord comes back, descending from heaven, his appearance will be visible to the whole world, as will the rising up of his people to meet him in the air, an event known as the rapture. Number three, the rise of the Antichrist. After the church is taken out of the way, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, a satanically empowered man will gain worldwide control with promises of peace. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. 
he will be aided by another man, called the false prophet, who heads up a religious system that requires worship of the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. The spirit of Antichrist. Now, I would like to examine one of the main outworkings of Satan's kingdom, because it defines the core of our spiritual warfare. This opposition manifests itself in what I call the spirit of the Antichrist. This, as we will see, is distinct from the one person called the Antichrist, who in turn is distinct from the many Antichrists that have arisen throughout history. This spirit and these persons are described primarily in the teaching of John. 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 23. Boys, lads, it is the last time, hour, the end of this age, and as you have heard that the Antichrist, he will oppose Christ in the guise of Christ, is coming. Even now many Antichrists have arisen, which confirms our belief that it is the final, the end time. They went out from our number, but they did not really belong to us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they withdrew, that it might be plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by, you hold the sacred appointment from, you have been given an unction from the Holy Spirit, and you all know the truth, or you know all things. I write to you not because you are ignorant and do not perceive and know the truth, but because you do perceive it and know it, and know positively that nothing false, no deception, no lie is of the truth. Who is such a liar as he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah? He is the Antichrist, the antagonist of Christ, who habitually denies and refuses to acknowledge the Father and the Son. No one who habitually denies, disowns the Son, even has the Father. Whoever confesses, acknowledges, and has the Son has the Father also. Let me clarify the true meaning of the term Antichrist. The word Christ is from a Greek word, Christos, which exactly corresponds to the Hebrew word Mashiach, from which we get Messiah. So when we say Antichrist, that means anti-Messiah. Anti is a Greek preposition. It has two meanings and both of them apply. First of all, it means against. So the first operation is against Messiah. The second meaning is in place of. The ultimate purpose is to replace the true Messiah with a false Messiah. The entire operation is therefore carried out in two phases. When you begin to realize this, you will see that the spirit of the Antichrist is extremely active in almost the entire confessing church. Further, in John's teaching we read, But this you may know, perceive and recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit which acknowledges and confesses the fact that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, actually has become man and has come in the flesh is of God, as God for its source. And every spirit which does not acknowledge and confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, but would annul, destroy, sever, disunite him, is not of God, does not proceed from him. The non-confession is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you heard that it was coming, and now it is already in the world. 1 John chapter 4, verses 2-3 through 3. We look at this passage along with the passage quoted earlier. We see the three forms of Antichrist. For starters, there are many Antichrists. Throughout the history of mankind, many Antichrists have appeared and been manifested. Secondly, there is the Antichrist, a certain person. This is the last manifestation, the final product of the spirit of the Antichrist. At the end of this age, Scripture makes clear there will be one last, most evil, most powerful ruler who will rule mankind for a short time, who will be the Antichrist. The third form is the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist is the spirit that works through every Antichrist. The closer we get to the end of the age, the more the spirit of Antichrist is going to intensify, and the more we will find ourselves engaging it in battle. Identifying Marks of This Spirit John has given us four distinct signs of the spirit of the Antichrist. These are of great importance. First and foremost, this spirit gets its start in association with God's people. They went out from our number, but they did not really belong to us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they withdrew, 
that it might be plain that they all are not of us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. For of all, then, the spirit of the Antichrist always begins in some way in connection with the people of God. But it doesn't really belong there, and that will be revealed in due course. The second mark of this spirit is that it denies that Jesus is the Messiah, as we see in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? And then John continues with the third mark. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Remember this. The spirit of the Antichrist does not deny the existence of God. Indeed, the Antichrist will claim to be God's representative. What the Spirit does deny is the relationship of the Father and the Son within the Godhead. And the fourth mark of the Spirit, given in 1 John 4, is that it denies the Messiah has come. It probably believes in the Messiah who will come, but denies that the Messiah has already come. The person known as Antichrist. The final manifestation of the Spirit of Antichrist will be the Antichrist. I want to examine some passages of Scripture so that you are not unaware of what Satan is planning. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul dealt with the emergence, revelation, and manifestation of the Antichrist, he who addressed preparation for the Lord's return. These actions are closely intertwined because the final satanic act before the return of the Lord will be the revealing of the Antichrist. Paul says, in fact, that the Lord will destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, we read, But relative to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and are gathering together to meet him, we beg you, brethren, not to allow your minds to be quickly unsettled or disturbed or kept excited or alarmed, whether it be by some pretended revelation of the Spirit or by word or by letter alleged to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has already arrived and is here. The word coming here is the word parousia in Greek, which is normally used for the second coming of Jesus. Paul wrote, Don't be shaken or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as is from us, because he knew that many Christians would be willing to believe certain predictions about the time of Jesus' return. Paul continued, let no one deceive or beguile you in any way, for that day will not come except the apostasy comes first, unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians has come. In the day of lawlessness, sin is revealed. Who is the son of doom of perdition? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. The term falling away in Greek is apostia, meaning an apostasy a deliberate rejection of revealed truth. This verse offers two titles of the Antichrist. First, he is the man of sin or man of lawlessness. He is the supreme embodiment of man's rebellion against God and rejection of God's laws. He is also called the son of perdition, the one who is headed for a lost eternity. Judas Iscariot is the only other person in the New Testament who was called son of perdition. He was a false apostle so, we see three different names for the same being, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition. And we are given one other important name in Revelation 13. This is part of the vision that John had. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. As I stood on the sandy beach, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. On his horns he had ten royal crowns, diadems, and blasphemous titles, names on his heads. And the beast that I saw resembled the leopard, but his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth was like that of a lion. And to him the dragon gave his own might and power, and his own throne in great dominion. And one of his heads seemed to have a deadly wound, but his death stroke was healed, and the whole earth went after the beast in amazement and admiration." They fell down and paid homage to the dragon, because he had bestowed on the beast all his dominion and authority. They all praised and worshipped the beast, exclaiming, Who is a match for the beast, and who can make war against him? Here we see the fourth title, the beast, a person who is going to arise to whom Satan, the dragon, will impart his power. Why will Satan give his power to that person? 
because this will enable that person to gain dominion over the entire human race and convince all mankind to do the one thing Satan most desires, to worship him. That's his goal. He's been working patiently on it for many centuries, and he's very close to his achievement. Notice, one of his heads had been mortally wounded and healed. This is a sort of false resurrection here. I do not know if this person will be assassinated, but he will apparently be dead and return to life. In his vision, John saw a scroll in the hand of God, but no one was found worthy to open it. So John was weeping. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 through 6. John was looking for a lion, but the lion is a lamb. That is a deliberate contradiction. God's installed ruler does not have the nature of the beast. He has the nature of the lamb, and he is exalted above all others because he gave his life. He has humbled himself. He has walked in the way of meekness and humility because he did not resist his arrests and persecutors. I believe that the church must show the same nature in these days. We have seen that the people worship the beast, and they all were convinced it was hopeless to make war with the beast. I am not certain what sort of circumstances will convince all the world that it is futile to fight back. When you consider the age of technology and weaponry in which we currently live, it is easy to believe that the situation pictured here could be close upon us. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 6 through 7, we see the Antichrist take action. And he opened his mouth to speak slanders against God, blaspheming his name and his abode even vilifying those who live in heaven. He was further permitted to wage war on God's holy people, the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given to him to extend his authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. He is the open challenger of God. He is not a secret enemy. He shakes his fist in the face of God Almighty. And who do you think granted him permission to make war with and overcome the saints? I presumed it is God, which is a very sobering thought. Let's never forget that Christianity is not all easy victory. Let's go further and look at verse 8. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. And all the inhabitants of the earth will fall down in adoration and pay him homage. Everyone whose name has not been recorded in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain in sacrifice from the foundation of the world. As that day approaches, our battle plan then becomes clear. Look again at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. I believe this falling away is taking place in the world today. Through the centuries, there have been church leaders who were wicked, but they did not openly deny the great basic truths of the Christian faith. In fact, those truths were the means they used to support their power. But the 20th century saw church leaders deny the great basic truths of the Christian faith, the deity of Jesus, his virgin birth, his atoning death, his physical resurrection and his return. I do not believe this existed in any previous century. I believe that we are already confronted with the apostasy. Keep in mind that the church is the bulwark against error. Satan has to penetrate the church before he can complete his plans. And he is not working alone. Fallen angels have interacted with humans throughout our history. Number four, the three worst judgments. A period of seven years in which God's judgment is poured out on sinful humanity. Revelation chapter 6 through 16. The Antichrist's rise to power is associated with this time period. During the tribulation on earth, the church will be in heaven. It is thought that at this time, the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb will occur in heaven. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 10. The three worst judgments in the book of Revelation. Number one, seals. The seven seals. The mere mention of the book of Revelation can be spine chilling, not due to its horror story, but because it portrays the ultimate battle between good and evil, marking the end of the human journey. Revelation chapter 6 through 16 covers Satan on earth. This particular segment is the crux of the book and can be quite challenging to comprehend and put into practice. Unfortunately, we have arrived at the unpleasant part. The situation will deteriorate significantly before any improvement can be seen. Nevertheless, it is reassuring to acknowledge that the scenario depicted in these chapters is the worst it can be. However, even that is distressing enough. The seven seals are part of God's end of the world judgments. Revelation chapter 6 verses 1 through 17 details the seals. The action begins in chapter 5 of Revelation with the search for someone in heaven and on earth, someone worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. The scroll's significance becomes clear in light of events. On it must be written the program that will bring the age of earthly history in which we live to an end. The seven seals in heaven, according to John's vision, hold the scroll and as each seal is broken, a new judgment is unleashed on the world. The trumpet judgments and the bowl, or vile judgments, come after the seal judgments. The hunt for someone worthy to open the celestial scroll in Revelation 5 is the prelude to the opening of the seven seals in John's vision. John writes, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. The scroll includes God's judgments. No one has judged worthy of breaching the seals and unlocking the scroll, which saddens John. If the scroll could not be opened, evil would not be judged, and evil would continue to plague the earth. While John is sobbing over the unopened scroll and its seven intact seals, he receives excellent news. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. This is a representation of Jesus Christ, the slain lamb who is also the lion of judgment. As Jesus takes the scroll to open the seals and deliver judgment on the unbelieving world, the beings in heaven glorify him with a new song. Revelation chapter five, verse nine. And now they sing a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to break the seals that are on it. For you were slain, sacrificed. And with your blood you purchase men unto God from every tribe and language and people and nation. The Lamb begins to open the seals in the midst of the worship due to Him. The scroll can be unrolled a little further with each seal opened, exposing the judgments God has in store for the tribulation time little by bit. The first four of the seven seals open, releasing what are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse because the judgments appear metaphorically as a horse and rider leaving destruction in their path. The first seal. The first seal introduces the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 6 verses 1 through 2. Then I saw as the lamb broke open one of the seven seals, and as if in a voice of thunder I heard one of the four living creatures call out, Come! And I looked, and saw there a white horse whose rider carried a bow, and a crown was given him, and he rode forth, conquering and to conquer. Several details are gleaned from the biblical account. He rides a white horse, which represents peace at the start of the tribulation. The Antichrist will appear under the guise of bringing world peace. The Antichrist is given a crown, indicating that he will wield enormous power. He advances like a conqueror set on conquest while holding a bow, revealing his true intentions. The second seal. Great battles erupts on the world when the lamb releases the second seal. This is represented by a rider on a blazing red horse wielding a huge sword. The second seal's fiery red horse represents chaos. Following the initial period of peace that precedes the tribulation, the world will devolve into violence with people attempting to destroy one another. The third seal. Famine results from the breakdown of the third of the seven seals. The rider seen by John is on a black horse and carrying a set of scales in his hand. Then John overhears a proclamation that people will have to work all day for a small amount of food. 
the fourth seal. When the fourth seal is broken, John sees a pale horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed close behind him. As a result of the fourth seal, one-fourth of the world's population is slain by sword, famine, and pestilence, as well as by the wild beasts of the earth. Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 through 8. When the Lamb broke open the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living creature call out, Come! So I looked, and behold, an ashy pale horse, black and blue as if made so by bruising, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades, the realm of the dead, followed him closely. And they were given authority and power over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with famine and with plague, pestilence, disease, and with wild beasts of the earth. The Fifth Seal The fifth seal of the scroll indicates those who would be martyred throughout the tribulation for their trust in Christ. The Sixth Seal When the Lamb of God breaks the sixth seal, a great earthquake strikes, inflicting massive destruction and extraordinary astronomical phenomena. The sun goes black, the moon changes blood red, and the heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was displaced from its place. Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. When he, the Lamb, broke open the sixth seal, I looked, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun grew black as sackcloth of hair. The full disk of the moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky dropped to the earth like a fig tree, shedding its unripe fruit out of season when shaken by a strong wind. And the sky rolled up like a scroll and vanished, and every mountain and island was dislodged from its place. Survivors of the sixth seal, regardless of their social status, seek shelter in caverns and cry out to the mountains and rocks for help. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? An intermission in the book of Revelation follows the opening of the sixth of the seven seals. The seventh seal. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. When he, the Lamb, broke open the seventh seal, there was silence for about half an hour in heaven. The judgments that lead up to the end of the tribulation are now evident in the scroll, and they are so harsh that all of heaven falls silent. The seventh seal clearly heralds the start of the next round of judgments. As John instantly sees seven angels holding seven trumpets ready to blow. An eighth angel takes a censer and burns much incense in it, indicating God's people's petitions. When the seven sealed judgments are completed, the second phase of the tribulation, which includes the seven trumpet judgments, will begin. The seven trumpets. In Revelation chapters 8 through 9, John describes a time near the end of the world when angels sound seven trumpets. Each trumpet heralds the arrival of a new round of judgment on the people of the earth. The seven trumpets are described in Revelation chapters 8 and 9, as well as in Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. The trumpets represent disasters. The judgments heralded by the seven trumpets will occur during the tribulation period at the end of the world. Seven angels who stand in God's presence are given seven trumpets, which will be used to unleash another round of judgments. The first trumpet. Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there was a storm of hail and fire mingled with blood cast upon the earth. And a third part of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees was burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. This plague destroys one third of the world's trees and consumes all grass. This judgment bears some resemblance to Egypt's seventh plague. The second trumpet. In heaven, a second angel sounds the trumpet. The result is that something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turns to blood, a third of the ships sink, and a third of ocean life dies. Verse 9. This judgment is similar in some ways to the first plague in Egypt. The third trumpet. The third trumpet judgment is like the second, except it affects the world's freshwater lakes and rivers instead of the oceans. Specifically, a great star blazing like a torch, falls from the sky and poisons a third of the water supply. Revelation chapter 8, verse 10. Wormwood is the name given to this star, and many people die as a result. Verse 11. Wormwood. 
Artemisia absinthium is a shrub-like plant known for its extreme bitterness and poisonous properties in botany. The fourth trumpet. Revelation chapter 8, verses 12 through 13. Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was smitten, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that the light of a third of them was darkened, and a third of the daylight itself was withdrawn. And likewise, a third of the light of the night was kept from shining. Then I looked and I saw a solitary eagle flying in mid heaven. And as it flew, I heard it crying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the rest of the trumpet blasts, which the three angels are about to sound. The fourth of the seven trumpets brings about changes in the heavens. A third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. Revelation chapter 8, verse 12. Following the fourth trumpet judgment, John observes a special warning given by an eagle flying through the air. This eagle cries out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. For this reason, the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets are referred to as the three woes. The fifth trumpet. The angel of the abyss serves as the king of these demonic locusts. Revelation chapter 9, verse 11. In Hebrew, he is known as Abaddon, and in Greek, he is known as Apollyon, which means destroyer. The locusts themselves are described in unusual terms. They resemble battle-ready horses. They are dressed in something resembling crowns of gold, and their faces are vaguely human. They have hair that looks like women's hair and teeth that look like lion's teeth. Their wings sound like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle, and they wear iron breastplates. They have stings in their tails, just like scorpions. These beings will be given the authority to torture anyone who does not bear God's seal. The pain they cause will be so excruciating that sufferers will wish to die. Abaddon, Polyon, is the abyss's ruler and the king of these demonic locusts. The Sixth Trumpet the sixth trumpet and the second woe heralds the arrival of yet another demonic horde. When the sixth trumpet blows, a voice from God's altar requests the release of the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Revelation chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and from the four horns of the golden altar which stands before God, I heard a solitary voice saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, liberate the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been in readiness for that hour in the appointed day, month and year, were liberated to destroy a third of mankind. These four evil angels command a supernatural cavalry of thousands upon thousands to slaughter one third of humanity. The riders were fiery red, dark blue and yellow breastplates. Their horses have lion's heads and out of their mouths came fire, smoke and sulfur, and their tails are like snakes. They use their mouths and their tails to kill. Despite the severity and horror of these plagues, the survivors on earth will refuse to repent. They continue in their idolatry, their murder, their sorcery, their sexual immorality, and their theft. The seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet and the third woe sounds, and there are loud voices in heaven proclaiming, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. The 24 elders say, the time has come for destroying those who destroy the earth. Obviously, God is about to wrap things up once and for all. At the sound of the seventh trumpet, the temple of God is opened in heaven and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and a severe hailstorm. Verse 19. The seven trumpet judgments have come to an end. All is set for the seven angels with the seven bowls of God's wrath. These angels stand inside the now open temple, ready to step forward and bring the final judgments on earth. Revelation chapter 15. The seven bowls of revelation. The concept of the bowls, often referred to as the bowls of wrath or vials of wrath, is found in the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible. 
Basically, these bowls are like containers of God's wrath. By this time, people had done a lot of evil, especially under a leader called the Antichrist. Before the seven bowls are poured out, there are a series of other events and judgments. The first bowl. Revelation 16 begins with a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Revelation chapter 16 verses 1 through 2. Then I heard a mighty voice from the temple sanctuary saying to the seven angels, Go and empty out on the earth the seven bowls of God's wrath and indignation. So the first angel went and emptied his bowl on the earth, and foul and painful ulcers sores came on the people who are marked with the stamp of the beast and who did homage to his image. The first angel, carrying his bowl, approached the earth he emptied its contents. Immediately, a terrifying change occurred. Those who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image, the very emblem of their rebellion against the Creator, were suddenly afflicted. A foul and loathsome sore appeared on their bodies. People who once proudly showed their mark are now hurting and have painful sores on their skin. These marks are now sores. The second bowl. Following the first bowl, which brought painful sores upon those who bore the mark of the beast. The heavens prepared for another momentous act. The angel stepped forward. In his hand, he held the bowl filled with a mysterious liquid. Revelation chapter 16, verse 3 recounts the moment. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. As the contents of the bowl touched the waters of earth, a chilling transformation began clear blue ocean, full of life, began to change into a deep, thick red color. It looked like the dark, thick blood you'd see from a dead body. This change was not merely symbolic or superficial. The transformation ran deep, altering the very essence of the waters. Revelation chapter 8 verses 8 through 9 described a partial contamination of the sea. The contamination is complete here. Every living creature in the sea died. We read, blood as of a dead man. The sea doesn't necessarily become blood, but as of a corpse's blood. It will match the appearance and sickening character of the blood in a dead body. The third bowl. The rivers and springs aren't spared here either. They too turn into blood. Water, the very essence of life, is transformed into a symbol of death. This complete contamination is in contrast to the partial one-third pollution of fresh waters shown in Revelation chapter 8. In the face of such terrible judgments, John's vision serves as a stark warning, urging us to heed the words of the Almighty, to turn from wickedness, and to seek the refuge found only in the grace of God. The Fourth Bowl It was the time for the fourth bowl. An angel stepped forward, holding the next vessel of judgment. The target of this bowl was neither the land nor the water, but the very sun that lights up the sky. All of a sudden, things started to change. The sun, which had always been a source of light, warmth, and sustenance, was given a new and terrible power. It began to scorch the earth with an intensity never seen before. The heat was unbearable. Everywhere, people felt as if they were caught in an oven, their skin sizzling under the relentless fire from above. The pain was intense, searing through every bone, every fiber of their beings. And as they were scorched by the great heat, their hearts, rather than turning to God for mercy, became hardened. They shook their fists at the sky, not asking for help, but showing anger and disrespect to God. The fifth bowl, upon the command of the heavens, the fifth angel set forth, directing his bowl not to the seas, mountains, or rivers, but straight onto the very throne of the beast, the epicenter of wickedness. Revelation chapter 16, verse 10. Then the fifth angel emptied his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. And people gnawed their tongues for the torment of their excruciating distress and severe pain. When this bowl was poured out, it made the sun disappear, turning the beast's kingdom completely dark. Think of a world with no light at all, where it's so dark you can't see anything. This darkness wasn't calm or soothing. It felt heavy and made people really uncomfortable. The profound darkness, however, was just the beginning of their torment. The darkness of the fifth bowl is a preview of hell itself. Those under the judgment of this fifth bowl stand, as it were, on the shores of the lake of fire. 
You'd think, in the midst of such suffering, that people might fall on their knees, calling out for mercy or forgiveness, even when they were hurting. Instead of asking for forgiveness, they chose to resist God's warnings. Instead of calling out for help or praying, they spoke with disrespect. The sixth bowl. In his hand, the sixth angel held the bowl filled with God's judgment. It was clear that this vessel had a divine purpose, and the angel understood the gravity of its contents. The entire cosmos seemed to come to a standstill in anticipation of what was about to happen. The angel poured out his bowl over the stretches of the great river Euphrates. An event of such magnitude could only be best described by John, who bore witness. Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. Then the sixth angel emptied his bowl on the mighty river Euphrates, and his water was dried up to make ready a road for the coming of the kings of the east from the rising sun. As the water from the big Euphrates River went down, what used to block the way now became a clear path. The Euphrates River, an extended part of the fertile Crescent area, is a significant landmark in scripture and a valuable resource in the Middle East as it runs through Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. The seventh bull. In the heavens, the scene was dramatic. The seventh angel, with the final bowl of God's punishment, got ready to pour it out. This wasn't just any bowl. It was like the last chapter of all the judgments that came before. It really showed how severe and final God's decision was. Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. Then the seventh angel emptied out his bowl into the air, and a mighty voice came out of the sanctuary of heaven from the throne of God, saying, It is done. It is all over. It is all accomplished. It has come. This proclamation wasn't just an announcement, but an affirmation of the completion of God's ultimate judgment on earth. After that, the sky reacted strongly. Revelation chapter 16, verse 18. And there followed lightning flashes, loud rumblings, peals of thunder, and a tremendous earthquake. Nothing like it has ever occurred since men dwelt on the earth. So severe and far-reaching was that earthquake. This was not a regular storm. It was the most powerful one the world had ever seen. The intense earthquake was a testament to how serious God's last decision was, and nature was upset in the spiritual world because of it. As the dust settled, another profound revelation emerged. Babylon, a great city representing human pride, defiance, and decadence, was remembered before God, and in that remembrance, she was handed the cup of his fierce wrath. A city once formidable and dominant, it now splintered and fractured into three distinct parts, and its destruction was not an isolated event. Around the globe, other cities, bastions of human civilization, crumbled and collapsed in quick succession. The grandeur of man's achievements was swiftly being reduced to ruins. This announcement, coming from the throne itself, tells us that there will be no more delay in mercy. God has stretched out this scene as much as he possibly could. The seals were followed by trumpets. The trumpets were followed by bowls. But there will be no more judgments upon the earth after this. It is done. In these final judgments, God shakes the earth with a tremendous earthquake. During the chaos, it's natural to wonder how humanity reacted. Ideally, one would hope for repentance or an acknowledgement of the divine hand at work. However, even as massive hailstones fell from the sky, the human spirit remained stubborn. Instead of seeking forgiveness or understanding, the people cursed God. Revelation chapter 16, verse 21. And great, excessively oppressive hailstones, as heavy as a talent, between 50 and 60 pounds of immense size, fell from the sky on the people. And men blasphemed God for the plague of the hail. So very great was the torture of that plague. Their hearts, hardened by years of rebellion, couldn't grasp the magnitude of their error. Thus, the seventh bowl wasn't merely a demonstration of God's power, but a clear indication of human frailty and the consequences of persistent defiance. The story serves as a somber reminder that while God is patient and merciful, there comes a time when justice must prevail. The Battle of Gog and Magog In the first part of the tribulation, a great army from the north, an alliance with several other countries from the Middle East and Africa, attacks Israel and is defeated by God's supernatural intervention. Ezekiel chapters 38 through 39. 
Some commentators place this battle just before the start of the tribulation. Gog and Magog. Ezekiel 38 and 39 offer one of the most remarkable, but difficult to comprehend predictions in the Bible. These chapters foretell of a northern invasion of Israel that will arrive like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. Israel will appear to be doomed, yet God will intercede in this attack. Ezekiel chapter 38 verses 8 through 10. After many days you shall be visited and mustered for service. In the latter years, you shall go against the land that is restored from the ravages of the sword, where people are gathered out of many nations upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. But its people are brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell securely, all of them. You shall ascend and come like a storm. You shall be like a cloud to cover the land, you and all your hosts and many people with you. Thus says the Lord God, at the same time, thoughts shall come into your mind, and you will devise an evil plan. Because we are told that the invasion of Gog will take place in the latter years or days, this prophecy could be fulfilled in the first part of the tribulation. This is because the Antichrist will have a solution to the Middle East dilemma and will sign a seven-year peace deal with Israel during the tribulation. The Jews will be able to rebuild their temple and live safely in their land at this time. The invasion will thereafter take place. God had promised to revive Israel from the dead through the vision Ezekiel received of the Valley of Dried Bones. As exiles in the foreign land of Babylon, the Israelites had lost faith, but God assured them that they would once again live as a nation. Now the Lord continued to convey the wonderful hope and future He has for the children of Israel. Chapter 38 introduces us to Gog and Magog. The name Gog refers to the leader of the land of Magog. We are merely told that these occurrences will take place in the later days. The invasion of Israel will come from the north according to God's word. God informs us that he will allow this invasion so that the nations of the world will be compelled to realize who he is when he intervenes and exhibits his righteousness. The Lord expresses his rage at this invasion. Phrasing in verse 19 is reminiscent of an earthquake or maybe a nuclear bomb. In verse 20, we observe the aftermath of the disaster. Natural calamities, confusion, and terror will be used by God to kill these invaders. When he is done with Gog and his coalition, everyone will know that God is in power. The Battle of Armageddon At the end of the tribulation, Jesus returns with the armies of heaven Mark chapter 14, verse 62. He saves Jerusalem from annihilation and defeats the armies of the nations fighting under the banner of the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21. The Antichrist and the false prophet are captured and thrown alive into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. The complete truth about the Armageddon. Armageddon is mentioned specifically only once in the Bible. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 16, And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Despite its singular mention, the concept has taken on significant importance in our thought and imagination. Do you know that Armageddon is derived from the Hebrew Har Megiddo, Har meaning mountain, and Megiddo, which altogether means mountain of Megiddo, Megiddo itself is a historical site located in modern-day Israel, known for its strategic importance and as a place of numerous ancient battles. However, in the context of Revelation, Armageddon is not just a physical location, but symbolically represents the final battle between the forces of good and evil before the end of the world. When people hear the word Armageddon, they often think of big, world-ending events. The name makes people think of a big fight between good and bad and is often used in movies and books to talk about the world ending. But this name actually comes from old stories and places from a long time ago in the Middle East. The connection between the apocalyptic Armageddon and the historical Megiddo is profound. This name wasn't picked randomly for the end times battle. It has a lot of history tied to that area's past troubles. An ancient city with numerous battles. Megiddo was an ancient city located at a strategic crossroad in northern Israel, which connected the vital trade routes of Egypt to the south and Mesopotamia to the north. 
This geographical significance meant that whoever controlled Megiddo had a distinct advantage, both economically and militarily. Because of its strategic importance, the city became a focal point for many battles over the centuries. Notably, the Bible recounts one of the earliest recorded battles at Megiddo, where the renowned judge of Israel, Deborah, and her general Barak triumphed over the Canaanite king of Jabin and his commander Sisera in Judges 5. In the ancient lands of Israel, Megiddo wasn't just any place. It was a crucial crossroad, a place where many battles happened. One of the most memorable battles there involved the fearless woman named Deborah and her loyal general, Barak. And so, at Megiddo, through the faith and bravery of Deborah, Barak, and Jael, the Israelites saw the power of God at work, bringing them victory against overwhelming odds. Later in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 15, King Solomon fortified Megiddo along with Hazar and Gezer, recognizing its paramount strategic importance. Megiddo is a special place with a rich history. Think of it like an ancient crossroad city. It was so important because many big roads passed through it. Because of this, whoever controlled Megiddo could watch over and control these roads, making it a great spot for trade, travel, and military advantage. In the future, Megiddo would become famous for another reason. Many people believed it will be the site of a big future battle, often called the Battle of Armageddon. But that's another story. In short, Megiddo was like a major highway junction of the old times, and King Solomon made sure it was under his control. He knew its value, and that's why he made it stronger. Given its history as a battleground, it's not surprising that the prophetically inclined authors of the New Testament would draw upon Megiddo's legacy as a metaphor for the ultimate confrontation between good and evil. Its history is filled with battles and fights, which makes it a good symbol for the big final battle talked about in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 16, verse 16, where Armageddon is referenced, comes after the pouring out of the sixth bowl of God's wrath, which causes the Euphrates River to dry up thereby preparing a way for the kings of the east to come. The he in this verse likely refers to an unclean spirit or spirits mentioned in the preceding verses. Revelation chapter 16 verses 13 through 14, which go forth to gather kings for battle. Revelation portrays a great end times conflict between the forces of God and the forces of evil. Armageddon in this narrative becomes the gathering place for the world's armies under the influence of the dragon, beast, and false prophet to wage war against God and his people. Revelation, chapter 16, verses 13 through 14. The final showdown represents more than just a physical battle. It embodies the spiritual warfare that has raged throughout history, with Armageddon serving as the ultimate of this cosmic conflict. In the final days before the great battle of Armageddon, the world would bear witness to events unlike any in its history, unfolding in rapid succession. First, the rise of the Antichrist. The Antichrist, a charismatic leader endowed with supernatural powers, would emerge amidst political turmoil and societal decay. His rise would not be sudden, but rather a calculated ascent to power. He would be charismatic, persuasive, and offer solutions to the world's problems that would captivate nations. The battle itself, the skies darken and mysteriously silence grips the earth. Over the plains of Megiddo, a vast army assembles. It's not just any army, it's the force of the Antichrist, people finally going against what God wants. These armies converge to make a last stand against the will of the Almighty. As tensions rise, a hush falls over the land, an impending storm is about to break loose. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Revelation chapter 19, verse 19. Suddenly, piercing the darkened sky, a radiant beam of light illuminates the horizon. And there, at the forefront, is a magnificent figure astride a white horse, the embodiment of righteousness and justice. It is Christ, returning in all his glory. After that I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse appeared. The one who was riding it is called faithful, trustworthy, loyal, incorruptible, steady, and true. And he passes judgment and wages war in righteousness. 
holiness, justice, and uprightness. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. With Christ, a vast host of angels descends, their radiant wings sparkling in the dim light. Their presence signifies the might and majesty of heaven, standing in stark contrast to the dark forces below. Flanking Christ are the saints, those who had remained faithful to him throughout the ages. They too are on white horses, dressed in pure white linen, representing the righteousness of the saints. And the troops of heaven, clothed in fine linen, dazzling and clean, followed him on white horses. Revelation chapter 19, verse 14. As the battle of Armageddon commences, it is not like any other battle known to man. This is a battle between light and darkness, good and evil, the divine and the profane. The angels, wielding the power of heaven, clash with the forces of the Antichrist. The air is filled with the sound of swords and the cries of the fallen. But even in this fierce conflict, the might of the Antichrist and his armies is no match for the divine power of Christ and his heavenly hosts. With a word, Christ brings forth judgment, and the adversaries are struck down. The Antichrist and his false prophet are swiftly captured. And the beast was seized and overpowered, and with him the false prophet, who in his presence had worked wonders and performed miracles by which he led astray those who had accepted or permitted to be placed upon them the stamp, mark of the beast, and those who paid homage and gave divine honors to his statue. Both of them were hurled alive into the fiery lake that burns and blazes with brimstone. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. The battle of Armageddon, foretold for ages is swift. The forces of evil, though vast and intimidating, are destroyed in the face of divine intervention. With the Antichrist defeated, a new era dawns. Christ establishes his millennial kingdom, bringing peace, justice, and righteousness to the world. No matter how powerful the forces of darkness may seem, they cannot prevail against the omnipotent will of the Almighty. And the dust settles and earth rejoices, one thing remains clear, the eternal reign of Christ has begun, and with it, a new chapter in the story of redemption and grace. Consequences of the Battle The Battle of Armageddon was not just a climax of warfare, but also a transformative tuning point for humanity and the Earth itself. Here, we delve into the profound consequences of this monumental event as depicted in the Holy Bible. The implication of Armageddon and the surrounding context in the book of Revelation are profound. The Final State of Satan Mystery The Final State of Satan Revelation chapter 20 speaks in detail concerning the final state of Satan and unbelievers. Verse 7 remarks that at the end of the thousand-year millennial kingdom, Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 3, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he took hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. We read, An angel coming down from heaven. The angel that will subdue Satan is anonymous, and we will know if it is Michael, Gabriel, or any other high-ranking angel. A Bible commentator noted this. The final importance of Satan is perhaps indicated in the fact that it is not the Father who deals with him, nor the Christ, but only an unnamed angel. However, we read about an angel coming down from heaven. It is important to note that Satan is not considered God's equal or opposite. Yet God allows Satan to continue because even in his evil, he indirectly serves the purposes of God. We read the phrases, laid hold, bound him, cast him, shut him up, set a seal on him. Satan tried to imprison Jesus in a tomb but couldn't. However, God has no difficulty restraining Satan. Many have wondered, is this a true event? Indeed it is. The battle is literal. The false prophet is literal. The slaying of the kings and their armies is literal. Satan is literal. And his binding must be equally literal. We read that he should deceive the nations no more. 
The revealed primary mode of attack by Satan is deception. Therefore, the best defense and weapon against Satan is the truth found in God's word. It is evident that Satan's deceitful actions still persist, indicating that he is not confined in the manner portrayed in the passage. Peter stated that Satan is free to roam like a roaring lion, searching for those he can harm. Satan will be released for one last battle along with the misled nations of the world. After he is defeated, we see the result. Revelation chapter 20, verses 9 through 10. And they swarmed up over the broad plain of the earth and encircled the fortress, camp, and God's people, the saints, and the beloved city. But fire descended from heaven and consumed them. Then the devil, who had led them astray, deceiving and seducing them, was hurled into the fiery lake of burning brimstone, where the beast and false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever through the ages of the ages. Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. It is inaccurate to refer to this as a final battle, as there is no actual conflict. The outcome is predetermined, with God ultimately putting an end to the devil and his followers for good. Following the battle, Satan receives eternal judgment and torment, together with the beast and the false prophet. Is this really eternal punishment? Yes, it is. The words mean exactly what they appear to mean. Then all unbelievers will be judged before the great white throne. Revelation chapter 20 verse 15 states, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. In the next chapter, Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 adds, But as for the cowards and unbelieving and abominable, who are devoid of character and personal integrity and practice or tolerate immorality and murderers and sorcerers with intoxicating drugs and idolaters and occultists who practice and teach false religions and all the liars who knowingly deceive and twist truth, their part will be in the lake that blazes with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Hell exists in a realm beyond our present realm. Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and the one who was seated upon it, from whose presence and from the sight of whose face earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, great and small. They stood before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged, sentenced by what they had done, their whole way of feeling and acting, their aims and endeavors in accordance with what was recorded in the books. And the sea delivered up the dead who were in it, death and Hades. The state of death or disembodied existence surrendered the dead in them, and all were tried and their cases determined by what they had done, according to their motives, aims, and works. Then death and Hades, the state of death or disembodied existence, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found recorded in the book of life, he was hurled into the lake of fire. Unbelievers experience ongoing torment and are unable to escape their judgment. The Bible tells us that the judge is Jesus. John chapter 5, verse 22 through 27. Even the Father judges no one, for he has given all judgment, the last judgment and the whole business of judging, entirely into the hands of the Son, so that all men may give honor reverence, homage to the Son just as they give honor to the Father. In fact, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who has sent him. I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, the person whose ears are open to my words, who listens to my message and believes and trusts in and clings to and relies on him who sent me has possesses now eternal life and he does not come into judgment, does not incur sentence of judgment, will not come under condemnation, but he has already passed over out of death into life. Believe me when I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, the time is coming and is here now when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear it shall live. For even as the Father has life in himself and is self-existent, so he has given to the Son to have life in himself and be self-existent. And he has given him authority and granted him power to execute, exercise, practice judgment, because he is a son of man, very man. The earth and the heaven fled away, 
earth and heaven flee from this throne. This is not a trial, trying to determine what the facts are. The facts are in. Here is the sentencing of someone already condemned. We also read, and the dead were judged according to their works. If people are not listed in the book of life, then each one is judged according to his works. Those who refuse to come to God by faith will by default be judged and condemned by their works. We read, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. Sin's lingering effects have been eradicated, including death. The last traces of sin's unlawful power are done away with. When a person refers to hell, the lake of fire is what they usually have in mind. We read, this is the second death. A Bible commentator noted, as there is a second and higher life, so there is also a second and deeper death. And as after that life, there is no more death, so after that death, there is no more life. At the end of time, Satan and unbelievers will experience the second death, in which they will be in the lake of fire. This dreadful situation is one no person would desire. This is why God has offered salvation through Jesus to anyone who will believe and patiently offers this salvation still today. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten Son, so that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is a far cry from Satan's original state. Before he became the devil, or Satan as he is also known, the devil was known as the anointed cherub. His name, according to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, was Lucifer, which means the shining one. Unfortunately, Lucifer, the anointed cherub, turned into the devil. Now, in Ezekiel 28, we are told about a specific cherub who can be identified as Satan. This anointed cherub embodied the pinnacle of wisdom and beauty. He was a wonderful created being. In the heavenly host, Satan held positions of high rank, status, and responsibility. Don't misinterpret the reference to Eden as the one in Genesis. We know that Satan was present in the garden as well, but in the form of the serpent. This is a reference to a prehistoric Eden. The Garden of Eden was a garden of plants and trees. However, in this Eden, the garden is made of precious stones. Many people believe that Satan has directed the praise music in heaven because of the musical instruments mentioned in verse 13. We all know that music has tremendous power, whether for good or evil. We've seen how Satan has used music to send false messages to our minds and hearts. We must remember that music has the power to either lift a heart to God or drag a soul to hell. As Lucifer, Satan was a shining star, the sun of the morning. His privileges should have made him the most thankful cherub. Satan became corrupted. Iniquity was discovered in him. The Lord then goes on to list three sins, violence, arrogance, and irreverence. He violated the holy position in which he ministered in God's sanctuaries. One unbreakable biblical spiritual principle is that when we exalt ourselves, we will fall. Satan attempted to exalt himself, but God said he would be cast into hell. However, when we humble ourselves before the Lord, we will be lifted up. We don't have to worry about lifting ourselves up when we humble ourselves and submit to his will. It will be taken care of by God. Luke chapter 10, verse 18. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. We may easily become discouraged if we only consider who Satan is and what he is capable of. Yet, he is a condemned person. It's simply a matter of time. When Jesus died on the cross, he demolished the devil's apparatus. So, why is Satan still active? Is it because he doesn't recognize he's been out of business? The devil is running around like a chicken with its head cut off. He's dead and doesn't even realize it. But God stated he shall be no more forever. We don't know much about Satan. He is a now condemned being who will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone one day. Until then, the Bible instructs believers to remain alert and attentive. The devil wants us to collapse like he did but we can hold our ground. Not only has the Lord Jesus Christ saved us, but he is also the only one who can preserve us from falling. According to what Jesus taught, hell does not have a set amount of time, but rather exists forever. 
those who are tormented in hell are doomed to an eternity of torment. Jesus was quoted as saying, the fire never goes out. Jesus said this as a warning to people that caused others to stumble. Hell is also called the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20 verses 13 through 15, a place prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew chapter 25 verse 41. A popular Bible commentator said about this verse, A child with a spoon may sooner empty the sea than the damned accomplish their misery. A river of brimstone is not consumed by burning. There is no way out of hell, and neither is there any relief from it or any solace to be found there. If you haven't put your trust in Him yet, now is not the time to put it off any longer. It is not too late to turn to God right now, but someday it will be too late. At the end of time, everyone will stand before Jesus Christ, and He will separate humanity into sheep, those who display their faith in Jesus via their good actions and goats, those who do not demonstrate their faith in Jesus through their good works, those who did not trust in Jesus Christ. The goats, on the other hand, will go away into eternal punishment, and the sheep will get eternal life. God the Father blesses and gives an inheritance to the sheep on Jesus' right hand. The goats on Jesus' left hand are doomed to eternal hellfire because they are prepared for the devil and his angels. The explanation offered is that they had an opportunity to minister to the Lord but did nothing. The damned ask, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? Jesus replies, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Jesus then ends the discourse with a contrast. They will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Jesus unfailingly disguised hell from the kingdom of God. Hell is the opposite of excellent fellowship with God eternally. The New Creation Seven rare facts, the new heaven, that many do not know. Number one, heaven and earth will perish. In his vision, John witnesses a new world where God resides with his people, eradicating all traces of sin, death, and sorrow. In the first verse, John predicts that the current world will come to an end. God created the earth with the potential for this prophecy to be fulfilled. The new heaven and new earth will replace the world we know and bring an end to issues like climate change and chaos. According to the Bible, the earth that we live on and the heavens that surround us will eventually come to an end. However, you as an individual will endure beyond their destruction. These elements will wear out like a piece of clothing and be replaced while you remain. The Bible unfailingly warns us that this particular world will not last forever. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, Sky and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. This means that trusting Jesus is wiser than trusting anything in this world. But then, how will the new heaven arrive? Well, keep watching to the end, and we will explain. Jesus also refers to the passing away of heaven and earth in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. For truly I tell you, until the sky and earth pass away and perish, not one smallest letter nor one little hook identifying certain Hebrew letters will pass from the law until all things it foreshadows are accomplished. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, John writes of a new heaven and a new earth in the eternal state having seen that the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. To pass away is to disappear or be no more. This refers to the physical heaven and earth, the material world and all it contains. Scripture is clear that people will outlast the current material universe, some in a state of eternal bliss and some in a state of eternal misery, and that the current universe will be replaced by another that will never know the contamination of sin. The method of this world's destruction is revealed in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10-12. through 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will vanish, pass away, with a thunderous crash, and the material elements of the universe will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up, since all these things are thus in the process of being dissolved. What kind of person ought to each of you to be in the meanwhile? 
in consecrated and holy behavior and devout and godly qualities, while you wait and earnestly long for, expect and hasten, the coming of the day of God by reason of which the flaming heavens will be dissolved and the material elements of the universe will flare and melt with fire. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. According to the book of Genesis, the world was once destroyed by a great flood during the time of Noah. However, God made a promise that there will be no more global floods in the future. Genesis chapter 9, verse 11. On the other hand, it is believed that in the day of the Lord, the universe will be destroyed by fire. The prophet Isaiah foretold the passing away of heaven and earth too. All the host of the heavens shall be dissolved and crumble away, and the sky shall be rolled together like a scroll, and all their host, the stars and the planets, shall drop like a faded leaf from the vine, and like a withered fig from the fig tree. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 4. The people are assured by the Lord that while the heaven and earth may be passing away, His salvation is secure. Have you ever thought about the fact that heaven and earth will pass away? It's a realization that can give us a lot of perspective in life. When we remember that this world is not our permanent home, we can prioritize what's truly important and live with a sense of purpose. But in accordance with His promise, we expectantly await new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Jesus tells us to have the proper priorities. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Jesus spoke of the renewal of all things, the time when all things are made new. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new age, the messianic rebirth of the world, when the Son of Man shall sit down on the throne of His glory, you who have become my disciples, sided with my party, and followed me, will also sit on twelve thrones and judge the twelve tribes of Israel. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. The disciples will have a distinct responsibility during the future judgment, likely involving administration in the millennial kingdom. Moreover, the apostles had the privilege of contributing to a unique foundation for the church, and they are recognized with a special tribute in the New Jerusalem. Revelation chapter 21, verse 14. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. There is some debate among believers as to when this renewal will happen. There are those who believe the universal restoration will occur when Christ returns and sets up His millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign on the earth. This view does not equate the renewal that Jesus spoke about with the making of the new heavens and new earth, as was prophesied by Isaiah. This will come after the millennium. But what is the size of this heaven? Will every Christian be able to fit there? Keep watching to the end, and we find out. When God spoke from His throne, the Bible tells us that God will make all things new. And the one who was seated on the throne said, And he who is seated on the throne said, See, I make all things new. Also, he said, Record this, for these sayings are faithful, accurate, incorruptible, and trustworthy, and true, genuine. Revelation chapter 21, verse 5. This means that the present order of creation will be replaced with a new one, where only God's people will exist and live in the closest of relationships. We read, he who sat on the throne said, This is a powerful proclamation that originates directly from the throne of God. It's noteworthy because it's one of the rare instances in the book of Revelation where we witness God Himself speaking unequivocally from His throne. We read, Behold, I make all things new. The statement is in the present tense. I am making everything new. This is the fulfillment of God's work of renewal and deliverance, having begun here and now in our present time. There are those who will have no part. Those who have not placed their trust in the promises of God will not have the opportunity to be part of it. Those who deny Jesus and turn away from their faith are not allowed to enter the new Jerusalem. The first among the sins of those who perish are their cowardice and lack of faith, with the fearful being the leaders in this list of wrongdoings. 
Some people lack the courage to face the challenges of religion, and their cowardice stemmed from their lack of faith. However, even though they were too scared to follow Christ's teachings and fulfill their obligations to Him, they were still reckless enough to engage in all sorts of detestable wickedness, murder, adultery, sorcery, idolatry, and lying. Jesus talked a lot about hell in his teachings. In fact, we can glean more information about hell from Jesus' words than from any other chapter of the Bible combined. Jesus spoke of hell as outer darkness. In the afterlife, the saints will be completely purified from all impurities. As death approaches, they'll be cleansed from everything that is defiling in nature. In the New Jerusalem, only pure people will be allowed among the saints. However, on earth, even with the utmost care, there may be a mixture of good and bad people in Christian communities, which may cause troubles. But in the New Jerusalem, the society will be entirely pure and without any impurities. Further point worth noting is that the New Jerusalem is exclusively reserved for the called, chosen, and faithful individuals who are not associated with hypocrites. How the new heaven arrives. According to the scripture, the occurrence of a new heaven and new earth will take place after the thousand-year reign of Christ, also known as the Millennium. The vision mentioned in the scripture describes the disappearance of the first heaven and the first earth, with no sea to be bound. A new world now opens to our view. The apostles saw a new world where the holy city, the new Jerusalem, came down from heaven. This new Jerusalem represents the church of God in its new and perfect state, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. It is adorned with perfection and wisdom and holiness and is worthy of experiencing the full glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Throughout the scriptures, the concept of a new earth, complete with a brand new atmosphere and sky, is a reoccurring theme that has been mentioned by numerous prophets. This notion of a new heaven and new earth is not limited to any one particular section of the Bible, but can be found in both the Old and New Testaments. It has been a source of inspiration and hope for many. The present heavens and the present earth will one day pass away. God, therefore, will dissolve the old universe and make it new by means of fire. Many equate the renewal that Jesus spoke about with this event, the making of the new heavens and the new earth. Our hope. The hope of the believer is in an inheritance that will not fade away. Heaven is called a city, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, indeed, and has readied a city for them. All over the world there are many beautiful cities, but we have yet to find a city that we like better than the one we come home to at the end of our journey. Eleven times in the book of Revelation, chapters 21 and 22, we find the word city. It's the place where God and His people will live together. It's not a figure of speech, but a reference to an actual physical place. And since we will be in our physically resurrected bodies when we live in that city, we will need a physical city to live in. It's not some dream place. It's not some idea. It's an actual place. The heavenly Jerusalem is a city. Now, this is not something that should surprise us because the longing for a city has been around way back from the time of Abraham. We read in Hebrews 11 about Abraham that he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. And the Hebrew Christians were told in Hebrews chapter 12 that they were to come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Paul mentions this city in his letter to the Galatians. He calls it the Jerusalem above. And in Revelation chapter 3 verse 12, it's referred to as the city of my God and the new Jerusalem still to come. The city will endure, it won't perish. For here we have no lasting city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. The size of the city. First and foremost, I'd like to discuss the size of the city with you. Has anyone ever said to you, how on earth is heaven ever going to be big enough for all the Christians from all time to live there? It's going to have to be a big place. So let me impress this upon your mind and heart today. Heaven, the city of God, will be the most incredible place you've ever heard of. One of the reasons that many people try to spiritualize and dismiss this city is because of its enormous size. It is a city that goes above and beyond what you can imagine. Now, if you work that out, 
To give you an idea that each one of the walls and the cube of it, they're all 1,400 miles. Between 1,400 and 1,500 miles. And the ground floor square mile is 2,250,000 square miles on the first level. Did you ever hear anything like that? London covers an area of 140 square miles. The city four square is 2,250,000 square miles on the first floor. This city is 20 times as big as all of New Zealand. It's 10 times as big as Germany. It's 10 times as big as France. It's 40 times as big as all of England. It is ever so much bigger than India. So, if Almighty God saves his best for last, and his final creation is this new city, wouldn't you expect it to be the most spectacular thing you could imagine? How is God going to drop a city like that out of heaven? Someone asks. With the same power that he possessed when he spoke a word and the world was created. The same power he possessed when he spoke and the creation was born. And if he says in his word that he'll do it, he'll do it. Thank you.